Welcome, everyone. It's nice to be with you. And Barbara, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I know that since they cut off questions, but since it's my presentation time now, I'm going to ask you my question. Um, you mentioned that you're involved with a lot of Head Start programs here, but uh, how, how far beyond local schools are you working? Uh, yeah, I've done some work in, with Head Starts in the D.C. area. We have an affiliation with Howard University. Um, they're not implementing at a high enough at the level that we would like to see yet there. Um, and we've done some work with Head Start or with um, uh, charter schools in D.C. Okay, um, in the D.C. area, then, do they have access to the technology that you're talking about as far as the, the iPads and things? Um, no, but they've been, they've been drawn upon the website. So. Okay. But so they're yeah, using the materials. Scalability and yeah, hopefully we just want to see ourselves get more um, accessible, visible. Good. Well, we wish you luck with it. Barbara and I work together at BYU. In fact, she's my boss. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we're both missing a faculty meeting today, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we're so happy to be here. Um, let me uh, begin, as we talk about children's writing, I thought I'd begin by sharing a few little books that were written by some first graders. This first one is called Animals, and it's by a little girl named Elisa. Some animals are fun to play with. Others are not. Bulls are not fun to play with. <laughs> And animals that are like bulls are not fun to play with. <laughs> but ones that are like cats and kittens are fun to play with. <laughs> this one's called Poem Book. And it's by a little girl named Rachel. Roses are red. Violets are blue. You are as fun as a park. <laughs> Mountains are beautiful, but you are sweeter than them. Sun is bright, but you shine too. Water is wet, but it makes beautiful flowers like you. Isn't that cute? This one's called Four Friends, and it's by a little girl named Ashby. Sleeping Beauty went to Jasmine's castle. She wanted to be friends. Jasmine liked Sleeping Beauty. And she said, I have a cousin, and she is coming tomorrow. Do you want to meet her, said Jasmine. Oh, yes, said Sleeping Beauty. Her name is Belle, said Jasmine. <laughs> Belle came. She was beautiful. Do you want to meet another friend, asked Belle. Oh, yes, said the other girls. Then Cinderella came in. <laughs> then Aladdin and the Beast and Prince Philip and the other handsome prince came in. <laughs> we want to play, they said. No way, said the girls. And the four girls lived happily ever after. <laughs> and the four boys cried their guts out. <laughs> so the question is, can kids write? And yes, the answer is yes. Even as young as kindergarten and first grade and second grade, those kids can write in powerful and passionate ways. So what they're not getting is the opportunity to write. I'm so grateful that Barbara has included in her program some interactive and shared writing because that's so often left out of reading programs. And we need to make sure that writing is included because, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, no child got left behind, but writing got left behind. <laughs> In fact, they're calling it now the neglected R, because we focus on reading, we focus on math, because they're tested, but writing has evaporated. We did a study right here along the Wasatch Front in Utah, in eight school districts, 177 full day observations from kindergarten to sixth grade. And the amount of writing just breaks your heart when you realize it. Oh, it doesn't sound that bad because, you know, it sounds like we've got about an hour a day devoted to writing, but then you realize that about 25 minutes of that is spelling. About another 20 minutes 
is what we call non-process writing or filling out worksheets. Their pencils are moving, but that's not the writing we're talking about. So that left us with only about 15 minutes a day of writing instruction, and most of that was taken up with mini-lesson, or teachers talking about six traits, talking about how to write, but the children not actually having the chance to do it. We see of the components of what most of us recognize as a writing workshop, a mini lesson, time for sharing, and time to actually be engaged in writing. Both shared writing with the whole class and more guided writing with small groups or working independently. Um, in the, those are the three components that we would label as a writing workshop. And when we looked, Although the components were obvious in some of the classrooms, there were only two classrooms out of 177 in which the components were all seen on the same day. So it tells me that we've got a ways to go when it comes to making sure that writing instruction is taking a place in our schools. Uh, I'm afraid that a lot of teachers say, oh, I don't have time for that. And what they're meaning is, I need to focus on things that are tested. And they're forgetting that the writing will indeed transfer into the things that are tested. Because writing is thinking made visible. And so when we're teaching writing, especially revision and editing, then we're teaching thinking. And that thinking is going to transfer into every test they take and beyond, into every aspect of their lives. Other teachers say, well, I'm not a writer, so I don't teach writing because I'm not a writer. Well, hello, these are first graders. I mean, I'm not a basketball player, but the little kids don't know that. They all think I'm Michael Jordan because I'm five feet taller than all of them. I mean... I've never let the fact that I'm not very good at sports stop me from teaching PE because I know it's important. And in the same way, we can't let teachers back away from writing just because I'm not a writer. We've got to assure them that, hey, they don't have to be a mathematician to teach math. They don't have to be, you know, they don't have to be a famous writer. They don't have to be a famous poet to be able to teach writing. They already are doing enough writing in their lives that they can teach it effectively. And it doesn't have to take that much time. So the key is motivating both teachers and students to include writing, not as an event, but as a regular part of the curriculum. Too often writing is just kind of an event like dance festival. Oh wait, we don't do those anymore either. Um, uh, Christmas. <laughs> Christmas! Alright, it comes once a year. And whew, we're glad that's over. And we treat writing like that. Our students at BYU, when they go out into their practicum experience, go out for four weeks in November, and now they're just starting their next practicum experience, which is four weeks in March. Well, it's really sad when kids can come back from four weeks in a classroom and I say, where's the writing? Where, did you do any writing? And some kid says, oh no, my teacher says we do that in April. <laughs> <laughs> what, like February's math month? <laughs> I always encourage educators to think about the Pledge of Allegiance. We do it every day. No big deal, we just stand up, we do it, we sit down, we move on. How long does it take? 30 seconds, a minute, and yet every kid can say it. Even the one that just came from Peru, even the one who just came from Cambodia, they can all say it. Why? Because we do it every day. We stand up, we say it, we move on. So writing needs to be that way. It needs to just be part of that regular routine. We don't have to hit it for long, but we have to hit it consistently. Not as an event, but as a regular part of the curriculum. 
then, just like Pledge of Allegiance, kids are going to be able to experience that success rate. But if they don't have it regularly, then they struggle. You know, because, uh, gosh, I don't know how to do this. I don't feel confident with this. I don't have many kids who are, you know, having stress attacks when we ask them to say the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, they don't usually fall apart. Because they know it. They can do it. That's a great success rate and a great pattern for us to follow after. Just a little bit every day. We don't make a big deal out of it. We don't do pre-pledge activities. We don't do post-pledge comprehension. No, we don't do pledge vocabulary busters. No! We don't do pledge to self-connections. No! We just do the pledge! And we move on. And that's how it's got to be with writing. Now, what's going to motivate that? I believe technology is the answer. I think technology can provide a tool for students and teachers. Not just a learning tool, but a motivation tool. Nothing motivates writing like publishing. Nothing. Being able to share your writing, being able to get it out there, that gets kids excited. But surely we can do better than this. I mean, this is publishing. This is a, a book. I mean, kids know what books like, look like, and this doesn't look like a book. They, they, they can't get too excited about this, but they can get excited if the books start looking like books. And that's what's available when we start looking at online publishing and we start seeing what kids can really produce and do. When I was a child in fifth grade, my teacher said, we're going to write a book. Oh, I was so excited. Now, I'd written before. I'd done a ton of stuff in school. <coughs> I'd done all my little stories and poems and reports. But there was something about writing a book that just flipped a switch in me. And as a little fifth grader, I just went crazy. I was so excited. Well, here's my book. I mean, you know, what this little handmade cardboard cover with contact paper. And it was even typed, and in those days that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. I found out that the teacher had sent our stories down to the typing class at the high school. <laughs> and they're the ones who typed up our stories, and whoever typed mine needs to <laughs> try again. But, um, you know, I mean, I didn't care about that at the, in that day. I was just so excited to see that my book was typed and that it looked like a real book and it got me excited and it kept me writing. Even through years in middle school and high school where it's not cool to write, especially if you're a boy because you're supposed to like war and killing people <laughs> and football and not writing poetry. <laughs> but it kept me writing. It kept me writing. Because I was so excited, I had been caught up in that whole idea of the magic of sharing my writing, of making something that's real. And that's what we've got to do with kids. I supervised a student teacher the other day who was teaching friendly letters. So then she says, all right, now I'm going to pass you a worksheet and pretend to write a letter. And I was just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> pretend to write a letter? Pretend you're writing a letter to a friend. No! Write the letter! Send it! For peace's sake, make it real. We're always practicing to do it. But when do we really do it? Oh, we got to practice so we're ready for junior high. Practice so we're ready for... Practice so we're ready for college. Practice so we're ready for a doctoral program. Well, when the heck do we finally do it? When do we actually do all what we're practicing and preparing for? <coughs> if we can do it, really do it, as young as kindergarten and first grade and second grade, <coughs> then kids are going to be able to gain that sense of audience, that sense of purpose, that will make writing real. And then you literally cannot stop them. Now, there are many online publishing outlets. Um, Blurb, Shutterfly... Um, heritage makers. There's lots of them. Most of them have very complicated tools and most of them are very expensive. You know, it'll cost you 60, 70, 80 bucks to publish a nice little self-published book. That puts it beyond the reach of most children and children's parents and teachers. 
This is one site that I wanted to point out to you called MightyAuthors.com that was created specifically with children in mind. The tools are very simple. There's only a few fonts that they can choose from because we don't want kids spending nine years choosing a font. We want them writing, all right? There, there's not a lot of bells and whistles because it's a very simple thing. But because it's simple, kids can get in and even kids as young as first and second grade can manipulate the tool and work with it. With a little help from a sixth grader or a fifth grader, a PTA volunteer or a parent, then they really can get that done and they can start producing their own little books. And instead of 50 or 60 or 70 dollars, then they can either print it out for free no cost to them, and staple it together, or they can, um, they can send it away to be bound paperback or hardback. And I'll show you quickly some of the things that kids have done. Here's some little paperback books that cost the children about seven to eight dollars. Okay, and these are done by little children. Here's <coughs> the three little pigs, Cinderella, the two brothers, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Tinkle the Dragon. <laughs> if you're going to have a dragon, I don't know that name will Tinkle. <laughs> Ethan's First Fishing Trip, A Fistful of Poetry, Under the Sea, The Case of the Missing Cat, The Age of Dragons, All About Esau. And the kids are so excited because what they've created is a real book. My Wish for You, The Three Little Dolphins and the Big Bad Blue Whale, What Babies Do, A Poetry Collection, Janine's ABC Book. And kids can really produce something that's exciting. Here's a little third grader's book, and you can see that there, he types in his text, and then he scans in his picture, this is Columbus's ship, and I don't know why it has an American flag on it. <laughs> Here's John Glenn out in space, standing on the moon. All right. Uh, but you can see that with just very basic effort, he gets this back, and oh my gosh, it's a real book. Take a look at this one. This one was done by a fifth grader. Her mom helped her with the illustrations, and when she was done... When she was done, she had her story and her illustrations here, and she had a real book. And this costs the parents about $18, which is what they would be paying for a regular picture book in a store. Take a look at this one. This one was done by a kindergartner, the snowman who played football. His aunt helped him put the words into the computer, they took his pictures and scanned them in, and when he was done, he had a real book. It looks like a real book, it smells like a real book, and there's a kid who is excited to keep writing and to keep that going. So, here's, here's a class, here's a class book that was done, in which each child did a page, and then the pages are scanned in, and the book is published, and they have their whole book of pink pinks that they've done together as a class. Here's another uh, class book that I'll share as I finish up. Um, this is, uh, I was at a school and I was telling them that a rough draft is kind of like writing in its underwear. And then I say, do we go out in our underwear? And they say, no. And I say, no, we have to finish getting it ready to go out in public. We have to do a final draft. Anyway, that's my little thing that I was saying to the kids. So I said, do we go outside in our underwear? And all the kids said, no. And this one kid says, no, but my dad does. <laughs> I thought it was so funny that I went into the fifth grade where I was supposed to be doing a shared writing, a class writing, and I said, what are some things that our dads do that they tell us not to do? <laughs> oh, we got a whole list. <laughs> and then every kid did a page, and we came up with, no, but my dad does. <laughs> do we go outside in our underwear? No, but my dad does. Do we burp at the table? No, but my dad does. Do we drink out of the milk carton? No, but my dad does. Do we pick our noses? No, but my dad does. Do, 
Do we, uh, do we stay up late playing video games with friends? No, but my dad does. Do we leave dirty clothes on the floor? No, but my dad does. Do we give hugs and say I love you? Yes, yes, yes we do. And my dad does too. Aww. Now, I went home, I threw this in Mighty Authors, just scanned in the pages, sent off, got the book back, and I took it to the fifth grade class, and I said, look, your book was published. How do you think those kids felt? Oh my gosh, they were just coming on. They were so excited, they had to share it with the principal, and they were sharing it with all the classes, and they're planning a sequel. <laughs> called Yes, and My Mom Doesn't. <laughs> I mean, the kids are so excited because the writing is real. It's a real book, and they are sharing it with others, and that's motivating more and more and more writing. I read a study the other day that broke my heart. It said that today, today, 10, 12 years after No Child left, Got Left Behind, <laughs> most high school graduates are graduating in America never having written more than a page and a half. And that is one draft writing. One draft writing. Now that scares me spitless. You're thinking, oh, no way, man, no way. Well, no, you're thinking about when you were in school. But today's graduates are leaving, never having written more than an opinion on this, a uh, response to this, never having to revise, never having to edit, and never having to publish. That's not acceptable. Because where's the thinking? Oh, they may not be professional writers down the road, but they've got to think. And the best way to teach thinking is through writing. The best way to improve that ability to reflect, revise, respond. I mean, think about the higher levels of thinking. Evaluation, synthesis. We're talking writing. Taking different parts, creating a new whole, evaluation, that's writing. And so I'm hoping that down the road we can use online tools a little more effectively to try to create that motivation, that sense of reality that I found in fifth grade that kept me writing. That's what our hope is. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry I went a little over. <laughs> Any questions? <coughs> because if not, I really will lack, and I will tack the sack, and <laughs> we will put you on a rack. <laughs> yes. Just a comment. I, I think you make a good point about uh, having authentic reasons to write, and the publishing process does empower children. So some ideas for other publishing outlets uh, in alternative what you have are, and more in a digital format would be an online tool called VoiceThread, which allows Excellent. you to publish VoiceThread. VoiceThread.com, there's a free educator account that you can sign up for. It's uh, three simple steps. Uh, you create, upload, and you uh, comment, and then you publish. It allows you to embed the uh, e-book or the online book into a blog or a wiki or a web page. Uh, and it allows parents to view that and leave text comments, voice comments, and even video comments back. So what I've found in using that with really young kids, kindergarten, first grade, is that they love to get the feedback from mom and dad, from grandpa, from their principal, on their writing. So that's a really nice tool that isn't producing a finished book, but it is another publishing But practice. yes, it is allowing the kids to have that sense of real audience. I'm not writing because it's a school assignment. I'm writing because real people are going to really see this. Exactly. And that's excellent. What a wonderful resource. If you want to play in this website and see what's there, um, you can put in teacher, teacher. If you use username teacher and password teacher, it allows you to get into the website and kind of see what resources are there. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. This is a comment also. Um, Fifteen years ago, you were in a classroom in a school where I was working, and you worked with a group of second graders for a week long on writing and we turned half the day over to you. Yeah. And you taught a group of 25 students to publish, to write and publish during that week. 
and those one of my daughter was one of those children and she still does a lot of writing. She still has the book that she published that week with you. Isn't that something? But, but beyond that, the, the students that were in that class were mixed years later into other classes as they went through through school. So they weren't always together. Right now, I I hadn't counted actually, but I was trying to count in my mind, and I can think of at least 16 of the students in that classroom who blog together and Facebook together right now using writing to communicate, and I, I yeah. really feel that that's a product of their love of writing that started that week in second grade, because my other children don't have that same writing connection with the peers that they grew up with. Yeah, well thank you. That's a very kind compliment. Um, but that's what happened to me. See, one fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Krebs, said we're going to write a book. And everything that went through that whole process, and you know what? And see, I, now, I, I always tell people, I'm the after picture. I know I look like a before picture, but I, I, I am the after picture. I mean, I am what we want children to be, because I'm a lifelong reader, I'm a lifelong writer, I'm a lifelong learner, and an audience doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to be J.K. Rowling and write for the whole world. An audience just has to be real. Mom, Dad, the people in the rest home, down the street, the sixth graders, the ninth graders, my friends on the blog. It just has to be real. It doesn't have to be huge. You know, it doesn't have to be paying. It just has to be real. Thank you. Give your daughter my best and tell her I'm very proud of her. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have also a comment from my past, at least almost 20 years ago, when I worked with a kindergartner in Finland. And we wrote a lot of books. And actually, the children themselves wanted to start every day by writing books. And then they went to the school. And one of the mothers commented to me after two years, when his son had passed the second grade, that during those pre, uh, school years, he did not make any progress because they only worked with the textbooks and workbooks. There was no writing. So you are very right. It's always um, the same <coughs> everywhere. Yeah. Textbooks and reading in general is outside in. Outside in. But we also have to give children a chance to learn from the inside out. And that's writing. That's art. That's, that's creativity from the inside out. And we need that balance. Listening is outside in. And that's good. But we also have to speak. We also have to have a chance to express. And I'm afraid in our schools, in our rush to get test scores, in our rush to get our annual yearly progress, in our rush to get the, the newspaper grading system off of our back, we have forgotten to keep that balance between inside out and outside in. So thank you for that comment. Thanks. You know, my, my uh, a kid came up to me and asked me to sign a book that I'd written. He says, will you sign this book? I said, oh, I'd love to. And I'm writing this little thing. And he says, my dad says that when you die, I can sell this on eBay. <laughs> Another time I was at a library and I was signing books for children who were all lined up. And this kid, this kid came up and he says, he says, uh, he says, so, he says, this, he says, are you worn out? Are you tired? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm kind of tired. He says, I know how to feel. Because at my school, I said, I wrote a story, and I have had to read it to, like, four classes, and everybody always wants a copy. <laughs> and he's just telling me the woes of being an author. <laughs> and, uh, and I just thought that was so cute, because that tells me that this kid is working inside out. So let's just all think about what we can do to use the online resources to try to motivate more writing in our schools. Hey, thanks so much.